conductive way And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and joining me today is Katie Schaefer to discuss the 2002 film Spider-Man. We are finally diving into some of the non-MCU movies a little more here. Katie, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm ready to talk about, uh, you know, probably what was, for a lot of the older listeners, their first good Spider-Man. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And this was definitely the first live action Spider-Man that I watched. But the thing is, I was so young that it was one of those things where I had watched it once and it didn't really stick with me. I was sort of that in-between age where I wasn't so obsessive over watching things. Right. It was just that funky age because, you know, like when I was younger, I would watch Scooby-Doo all the time. I would watch Pokemon all the time. And so those are things that stuck with me a little more. But I guess for whatever reason, Spider-Man just didn't. And I'm obviously way more into comic books now. Like I never really was into comic books as a kid. I was more, like I said, into the sort of the Pokemon and Scooby-Doo worlds there. So those were my obsessions when I was younger. And this came at a time where I was just sort of like probably in between phases. I was nine, ten when this came out. Nine. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt like the same way. Like I, I was, I didn't read comics until I, you know, hit my early twenties and, oh well, no, I think I was 20 when I started. And I didn't have a whole lot of exposure to Spider-Man. I did watch the X-Men cartoon when I was a child religiously. Okay. So, but I saw this probably a couple of years after it came out, I think. Before I saw, I, I saw it right before the second one came out. I remember that part much. But I am uh, just like a year younger than Peter Parker supposed to be in this. Okay. <laughs> so I was born in 85. So for me, I was, I was, I was intrigued by it, but I don't. I liked the second one a lot better, I think. So it also didn't really stick with me, but it was enough to get me going, hmm, this spider fellow seems quite interesting. Yeah, one of the things, too, is that, you know, Tobey Maguire is not my favorite live-action Spider-Man. That goes to Tom Holland, and I know I've discussed this on more than one podcast before. So for you, how did you feel about Tobey Maguire as... Spider-Man. Well, pre Tom Holland, he was my favorite. Okay. I really, I, th I think he works well in this role. He does a pretty good Peter Parker from like what I think of now as like the classic Spider-Man, where he was a lot more, you know, sweater vest and big dark glasses, nerdy. I think he portrays that Spider-Man pretty well, or that Peter Parker pretty well. But he doesn't have quite the attitude of and like quippiness yes thank you that's the perfect <laughs> word for it he does not quip well he is and tom holland can do both so now i've changed my mind but i still have like a fun i'm like well, he's not bad he's not andrew garfield who i found to be objectionable in both roles but i think he's good but tom holland has something more i think and Tom Holland definitely has more of that sort of boyish charm, I would say, because he's playing Peter in high school. And we see Peter in this, and he's finishing up high school. We quickly go through the origin story, which we will talk about in a bit. And basically, him and Mary Jane are kind of already going their separate ways after high school. And you're like, oh, okay, so we're just kind of diving right on in. We're not really spending any time with high school Peter. And while they kept the origin short, character development wise, I was just like, oh, you know, that's kind of a bummer because I like how they've let Tom Holland's Peter Parker grow a lot more over a longer amount of time. You know, he's been in what, five movies now already? Yes, I think so. And with this, obviously, they didn't have that whole universe to insert Tobey Maguire into these other movies. Sony maybe could have built something out at the time, but I think back in 2002, it was just one of those things where they were like, 
we have one of the biggest comic book characters in the world. We need to do something with it. And right now. so you have <laughs> Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker. You have Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane. And you're kind of like, they all look a little older than they should, with maybe the exception of James Franco, who kind of played his role as far as age-wise goes a little better, I think. I agree. I think, well, and he'd been playing a teenager in Freaks and Geeks before this, and he was right. good at it and that. I think, yeah, this was still felt very 90s, like late 90s, of course, but still it's right on the cusp of a big change in how casting works, I think. Like, they, there, it's not as common now in those kinds of films to cast, you know, a 23 or 24-year-old. You cast, like, a 20-year-old instead so that they can still have that babyish face and so yeah there, there's definitely a lot of you know he looks like an adult especially once he gets all the muscles and he takes yeah. his shirt off you're like well that is not the body of like a 17 year old it's just just not so i think and mary jane they i agree there's just so little character development especially for her we right. get most we get some very surface level with peter but i think the movie does kind of it's enough to draw in new viewers probably, but really that's a movie for that gives what we would call now fan service <laughs> where like, if you know the details of Peter Parker, you're going to appreciate what's going on a lot more. You can still have fun, but you're not really going to understand like all the nuance of this character or the other characters in the movie. Yeah. Plus then you have Joe, Manganiello playing Flash Thompson. I probably totally butchered his last name there. And he's just sort of this giant dude. I mean, granted, he's a little scrawnier then than he is now. But you're yeah. just like, yeah, that's not what anyone in my high school really looked like. You know, you no. maybe have a few kids who matured at a faster rate than others, but not the entire high school. <laughs> right. So you're just like, uh, okay. You know, they definitely look more college age at this point. So I guess in a way it's kind of nice that they didn't linger on high school in this one and instead chose to be like, okay, no, we're done with high school. Peter has his powers. Here we go. Right. And what they did do really well with the casting, though, was casting both Cliff Robertson and Rosemary Harris as Ben and May Parker and obviously J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah oh. Jameson is just so fantastic. His casting is perfect. There's no one else who can play that role as well as he can. He's just so... Yeah, everything about J.K. Simmons is to be applauded in these films. Um, and I agree. Like, Cliff Robertson and Rosemary Harris are just... This is such a classic Spider-Man style film. And they fit perfectly into that. You know, with her little white bun and yeah. <laughs> big gruff face and bushy brown hair. Like, that's going great. I think it all works so well. And it's something that's recognizable even for those who haven't read the comics because they, you know, they're a little, a cute little old couple, which everybody knows about that trope anyway. Yeah, I've always thought it was weird how old she was in the comics because I was like, okay, well, if she's just Peter's father's sister, I know what is going on here because she's like 20 years older than him. And right? it's one of those things where I think a lot of people sort of just looked past that because of how iconic she became within the Spider-Man universe. And obviously we've seen her get younger and younger as the different movie series come about. Right. So that's sort of funny to see how they're changing that character over the years while trying to keep Peter relatively the same, I would say. Obviously inserting him into the MCU, you're going to have a different storyline and I know some people are upset that th that they don't have the Uncle Ben storyline but this movie actually gives us a really good Uncle Ben storyline and I totally forgot about the really good aspects of the story that began with this one and really ramped up in Spider-Man 2 and then you know we we won't talk about Spider-Man 3 just yet because I don't no. know who wants to do that <laughs> no Oh, that movie. I, I think there's some fun stuff in that movie, but it is it is real... Um, Messy. <laughs> Batman and Robin level campy. Yes. And I love Batman and Robin because it's so freaking campy. Uh, I, I think that this movie does that Uncle Ben storyline so well. 
that is, we don't, if you want to see that story, just watch that movie because it captures all, all the nuances and all the depth that you need for what that, you know, origin is. And like, I, I was glad that they didn't redo that with uh, the new, the MCU version of Spider-Man because, or how Into the Spider-Verse changed it up and gave us something new and interesting to work with. And because this film is in that regard, iconic as one of the best origin stories or telling of an origin story is out there. Yeah, I quickly want to give a shout out to Bruce Campbell's cameo in this oh. as the ring announcer. <laughs> yes. Because he and Sam Raimi had known each other for a while. So he actually ended up getting cameos in this one and in Spider-Man 2. I don't know about Spider-Man 3 necessarily. No, I think he's in that one too. Okay. He's in almost all of Raimi's movies. He makes an appearance just like his, Raimi's uh, younger brother, Ted Raimi. He's in. Yeah, he's in this too. And all the rest of them. He's the assistant for J. Jonah Jameson. Which is just a hilarious role to just be like, oh, you're my brother. Let me put you here. <laughs> he always gets those kinds of roles. For those who watched a lot of Xena Warrior Princess, his character in that is a bumbling fool. And I've had friends who've gone to uh, cons that he's been at, and they said he is just a super weirdo. So I was like, well, he's good at acting that way, too. Yeah, and I know I had told you about this book that I bought recently, which is The Unseen Force, the films of Sam Raimi, and it came out right around the time Spider-Man 2 was in development, so there is at least a decent-sized chapter on this film, and there were just some facts in there that I didn't even know. Ron Howard at one point was set to direct this instead of Sam Raimi, and that kind of makes you wonder, okay, what would a Ron Howard Spider-Man <laughs> look like? Oh, but God. Because of knowing Sam Raimi's background, even though I haven't necessarily seen a bunch of his films, you can definitely pull his influences and see where he decided to put sort of these horror elements. And, you know, I've actually already recorded my Spider-Man 2 episode. I did the recordings out of order, but you guys will be hearing that one after this. And that comes up in the second movie as well, because you have some scenes that are just totally taken from a horror movie, but put into the context of a superhero movie. And I like when directors are willing to blend the genres. We've seen movies like Wonder Woman do that now. And it's becoming more and more common with superhero films because now that they're so popular, it's not enough to just be a superhero film necessarily. You do have to tell these other stories that are relatable. It can't all be, you know, Tony Stark being a billionaire. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Raimi is great at that in all the films he does, I think. I've seen a lot of them. And it this one, even this one has those little bits of horror, like the final fight scene between Peter and uh, William Osborne is brutal for a movie of that time. I mean, he doesn't show a whole lot, which he's good with working with a little bit to say a lot in his directing skills. And he does that very well in this that keeps it very tense, but not so tense that you couldn't watch this, you know, at six or seven. Absolutely. And story wise, I think he does a good job of keeping it well paced so that you aren't like, oh my goodness, can we just get past the origin story, which is a major problem with a lot of superhero movies some do it really really well like i love the first iron man movie even though that is a lengthier origin but it's like okay when iron man came out not everyone was familiar with iron man arguably a lot more people were familiar with you know batman superman spider-man oh yeah those oh, yeah. are the origin stories that we don't necessarily need to be hit over the head with. So he's like, okay, you know what? School trip. Here's the spider. You know, we're changing things slightly, but the way that Uncle Ben dies, that's all still the same. We pulled that straight from the comics and we're going to give you this story. And then here's what happens after the fact. You know, we don't spend too much time with Peter trying to figure out how to use his powers. We do get this kind of weird montage and i was yep. just like wow this is so very early 2000s or like you said kind of mm -hmm. late, late 90s rolling yes. over into the early 2000s and i was like i don't really like this <laughs> yes you look at it now and it's so 
it feels crude, which is not in like a a naughty or nasty way, but it crude and like it's an idea that's kind of how it's being presented is new. This is something that's used it used so many special effects that really just hadn't been seen before. And so putting it together, it's like, okay, well we have to work within these very specific limitations and tell this little bit of the story without it taking up this huge amount of time. But now you can do that in with the effects budgets and teams we have today, you could tell that in, you know, one minute long shot. Here it's given like a five minute montage of him figuring things out. But Raimi also manages to make it funny if a little like ooh, cringeworthy at, at this point. I totally know what you mean by saying that it's crude, but not in that sense. And during that montage, when Peter is like designing his suit, they actually got a comic book artist to be in that. And it was their hand drawing the images <laughs> so i, was I like, figured you know that was a very smart move and i'm totally blanking on who it was but i will figure it out and do a live follow-up on the podcast here if i manage to find that information but i just thought like little tidbits like that from the unseen force book were pretty interesting and i only read this the two Spider-Man chapters so far, so I'm going to go back and read it for like more context as to who Sam Raimi is as a director and a storyteller, so that should be pretty interesting. But I want to talk about some of the specific relationships that this story tries to present to us, because obviously Peter has this thing for Mary Jane, and then she ends up with Flash Thompson, or she's with Flash Thompson at the beginning of the movie, I believe, and then ends up with Harry, even though Harry knows how much Peter likes Mary Jane. And I was like, this is some weird trio love triangle thing going on, and I don't really care for this. <laughs> yes, yes, it feels weird and like ooky. <laughs> That's the best word I can think of for it. Just like, oh, dude, don't do that. What are you doing? And it makes you question, like, Peter, why are you such good friends with this dude? <laughs> yeah, this was a version of Harry that felt very compact compared to what we get from the character in the comics. It was like, okay, we're going to present Harry this very specific way, and it's only going to get worse. So... When you have him going through more character development, arguably, in the second movie than this one, you're like, okay, why is Peter still, you know, sticking around kind of thing? And I think a lot of it has to be because, you know, he's quote unquote the nerd and he doesn't have a lot of friends. So it's one of those things where, you know, Harry, in a sense, in the comics is a bit of a nerd himself, but because he comes from a rich family, he can kind of be the cooler nerd. Yep. And that is something that Peter is just kind of the complete opposite of. He is constantly struggling to get money, and we see that Aunt May is struggling to get money, and he just has one bad thing after another happen to him, and you're, you're like, okay, clearly Peter can't catch a break. But then Harry, of all people, is going to pile on on top of that. It was, you know, already bad enough that Mary Jade was going out with Flash Thompson. And I actually kind of would have preferred if they explored that more than just having her ditch Flash and end up with Harry. Because Flash really wasn't a huge part of the movie. He showed up a handful of times. Yeah, he's got maybe three four or five lines, you know, because other than that fight scene he has with Peter in the locker or in the lunchroom, it's kind of, that's his moment that tells us who he is. And then, and then after that, I think he's just kind of done. Yeah, that sounds about right. Or we see him again later when he picks up Mary Jane from the house in his oh, that's fancy right. car. I don't know if that comes before or after. I'm pretty sure it's after. When you watch too many Spider-Man movies, things get confusing. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. Yeah, I think that they really could. The other thing that would have been more interesting, which we get more of in season or in season in the second film is his relationship with Aunt May, because Aunt May is also not her character is not explored really at all other than, you know, she's Peter's aunt and Ben's wife. But they never really get they don't get enough moments together for you to feel how strong their bond is. 
you, you know it's there, but the movie uses too much shorthand for it, whereas it uses just the right amount with Ben and when he dies and we see so much of what that does to Peter because of his choices. And that is handled really well, but it feels kind of lackadaisical when it comes to Aunt May. Right. One of the other relationships I wanted to touch upon, because we didn't even mention Willem Dafoe in the casting, which is oh, yes. another another great just casting job because he plays villains so well. And he is kind of just equally as awkward as Peter in some moments. And you're like, what is going on with this dude? It's like oh, he yeah. is socially inept in a way that Peter can definitely relate to. But because he has so much power, it kind of doesn't matter for him because he's going to get what he wants whenever he wants. And with Peter, it's like, you know, he couldn't even ask Mary Jane out. Yeah, I I totally get that. I love I love Defoe. I think he's just one of he's one of the best actors of his generation, in my opinion. And he brings a lot to this. And I think it's very cartoonish performance that is almost over the top. But I think that's kind of what Raimi wanted in the film, because that's kind of how the goblin is. You know, he's he's crazy for lack for a colloquialism. He's, you know, way out there and does weird, ridiculous things because he's got this goblin in his head type situation and it doesn't, and it works in the movie. But even with that, Defoe gives maybe too much at times, <laughs> but it's so fun to watch. I think a role like the Green Goblin calls for that though, because you know, I'm sure as you've read in the comics, he's a very over the top villain. And he is. a lot of them are, especially how they were written in the Stan Lee era of comic yes. books. And you get a ton of exposition in those comics. Sometimes I get exhausted reading the older comics. I'm like, why are there so many words? Why? And as someone who reads a ton of books, that probably seems weird for me to say that. But sometimes you just want like, a few pages of just art that tells the story without needing to be walked through it every step of the way, which is kind of how Stan Lee wrote comics back in the day. And I understand why that is, because comics were a newer thing. People didn't really know what to think of them. And so you have to sort of spoon feed them the story. But now you'll see comics where you could go, you know, two, three pages with no dialogue at all. And you know exactly what's happening. Exactly. It's a it's an art medium that has grown as it's developed. And I think this one taps more into that more classic style with yeah. some of the speeches that the goblin gives. Yes. <laughs> and and, you know, but you have to admit that like the goblin, a green goblin is iconic, especially considering that you and I podcasted about maximum overdrive and there's a green <laughs> yeah. goblin headed there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's one of the most well-known villains. Right. And speaking of artists, I did find the artist's name for the one who actually draws the suit designs, and it's Phil Jimenez. Okay. Great artist. Yes, so yes. he has many, many years under his belt, and that was sort of a cool thing for him to get to do, because he was like, you know what? I get to be in a Spider-Man movie, even though it's just my hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because And doing what he does best. Yeah, and... There are some cool suit designs coming out of that montage there. You're like, okay, this is this is pretty cool. And to just have that added element of him literally going and sketching out the suit designs, I was like, okay, cool. He's not just going into, you know, a lab testing out different materials. He's he's thinking this through. And while we don't get like a homemade Spider-Man suit like we do with Tom Holland, which is entertaining in its own right. It's one of those things where you're like, yeah, there's definitely some flaws with him creating this first suit. And we see him run out of web fluid at times. And even though that is something that's different, too, which I want to discuss, he runs out of web fluid, but it's like built into him. So it's his web fluid. It felt weird. I was thinking, yeah. And what? in the comics, he builds the web shooters. Right. Which I liked that they kept that in the MCU. Yeah, so I think this is something that was also pretty weird for people because they were like, um, that's kind of weird. And 
<laughs> the way they portrayed it was like, oh, this is a high school kid learning about his body. And I was like, no, don't do that to Spider-Man for me. <laughs> no, no, I don't need, you know, jizz coming out of his wrists for because that's that's what it feels like. That is the... That is the reason that it happens initially, and you're like, oh my god, did I just see what I just saw? <laughs> and then he has to figure out why it's not working, and I'm like, this is this is too much. I yep. understand why they <laughs> they made that creative choice, because he is a kid coming out of high school who is socially awkward, and it does fit with the story, but I was like, I don't really need that. Right. That is an element that does not need to be added for me to be able to understand what Peter is going through. He can keep the puberty metaphors. Thank you. Thank you. We all have enough of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really do. And I think just what they did get right with the story, though, was the pacing of it, how much time they spent on these things. And while they didn't get all of the characters perfectly, I guess, represented is the best way to put it, like Mary Jane and at times you know, Norman Osborn, you see where they are going. And I think Mary Jane is done the the most disservice throughout this series of movies. And I think that's just because they didn't really know what to do with her character. And it's kind of that way in the comics at times too, but in the comics, she disappears for like short periods of time like you won't see her for a few issues and then she'll come back and then you have Gwen Stacy in the mix. And so it feels like with all three of the different Spider-Man movies, you have different pieces of the story. So this one takes the Mary Jane relationship and really runs with it, but maybe not in the best light. Then you have the amazing Spider-Man that goes the Gwen Stacy route and then you have Tom Holland's Spider-Man and they introduce Michelle, who is MJ, but not exactly like Mary Jane. And arguably, I like her character more just because she's definitely way more independent than Mary Jane is in this series. So you have these different iterations of various Spider-Man stories. And I like that this one does exist despite the flaws. Yeah, I feel like it was a a harbinger of what was to come when in regards to superhero films. And well, I totally agree. Like it does not do well with Mary Jane. She's more of a reflection of the male characters needs and intentions than anything else. And they do a little better with it, I think in the second one. Uh, but she never really becomes as much of her own distinct person like MJ in the Tom Holland series does, but I don't think they had either the capability or the interest in doing that in 2002. It just, that was not how movies were made then. And I think they did as good a job as they probably could considering their limitations and the culture of the time and how people looked at comic books. So I agree. I like that this movie exists. I think I still watch it periodically. I think it was the first Spider-Man movie I showed to my kid. It's it's a great introduction to who the character is, even if it may not be the best iteration of that character. Another thing that this movie does with the story is it doesn't focus really on one big bad villain. You know, you have the carjacker who kills Uncle Ben, but really it's a lot about Peter's struggle and how he is learning about his powers, trying to overcome that. And yes, we do see Willem Dafoe as the villain too, but it's one of those things where a lot of this movie is set up for what comes next in the second one. And I think that's fine. You know, this was not the first time that we had seen a live action Spider-Man on the screen, but it was the first time it was done at this caliber. And they had to take their time to set up this character and make us understand why we should like Peter Parker. Yes. You know, I think the pre the, probably the biggest previous iteration of the story was, you know, Spider-Man and Super Friends or is that the right show? Spider-Man with the, the really old one from or like the early 90s, maybe. Okay. And 
I agree. They had to kind of rebuild this character in general audiences' minds. And I think this is a, this is a very acceptable way to do that. And I was, I think it did it better than the amazing Spider-Man, <laughs> you know, that movie tried to then rehash what we've already seen and add to it in a way that just did not work. But this movie, even though it's very campy and a little outrageous and a little, a little much at times, it's still, it's still fun to watch and it still works very well within the story it's telling. Yeah. Is there anything else about the story in particular you want to discuss? Because I do have a few things I want to discuss visually for this movie because there's actually quite a bit to unpack there. <laughs> oh, no. Let's get to the visuals. So when I was watching this, I was like, oh, this is very early 2000s as far as the CGI goes <laughs> and everything, because all of a sudden Spider-Man would be swinging. And I was like, why does this look so weird all of a sudden? Yep. It's not nearly as fluid as it is today. And obviously it's 2019, it's 17 years later. So we can reasonably expect the technology to improve between 2002 and, you know, Spider-Man Far From Home, which came out earlier this year. Right. So it was just something that because I watched this again after so long, I had not seen this movie probably since the first time. I had watched it when, oh, wow. whenever my parents bought it on DVD all those years ago. And I had little to no recollection of what happened in this movie, what it looked like. I remember just thinking it was fine. You know, I was never one of those people that had super strong opinions about all of the Spider-Man movies. And okay, you know, these ones are better. And obviously now I'm <laughs> digging into that more for this podcast because I really like Spider-Man, so why not? And just visually, I was like, oh, we entered a video game all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's very obvious now when you watch it. Like, But at the time, I remember thinking, wow, this is really amazing. <laughs> I mean, the budget was $100 million, which was ridiculous money to spend on a movie at that time like especially something like this that was kind of a gamble yeah but, i think know. it was over too over a hundred million yes oh i'm sure i'm sure that's that's their admitted budget i think yeah <laughs> and then it went on to make you know 821 million so obviously this was something that people enjoyed visually because if it was that bad in 2002 like if it looked like an 80s movie in 2002 people would not have liked it as much you know right. it just would not have fit with what they were trying to do but at the time it was pretty groundbreaking and it really set the tone for I think what superhero movies would go on to become and obviously in my opinion they've worked out some of the kinks with the casting I really do love the cast that they've put together with the new Spider-Man films, just because I really believe those kids are in high school, even though I know they're not in real life, but they're just so much closer in age to high school kids to make it more believable. You know, like I've had people ask me what high school I go to and I'm like, no, I finished that a long time ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when I it's was, more believable. Yes. <laughs> it is. It is. It's just, it works better and they feel, they're able to produce that feeling of like awkward teenagehood that, I mean, again, these kids, the Peter and Mary Jane and Harry are all supposed to be like 18, 19, but you still have that weird sense of awkwardness and like not being quite sure where you're at in life and all of that because you're growing up. And I think the Tom Holland and, and crew are able to do that a lot better than Tobey Maguire was, but I still think that is a lot because of the, the time, you know, 90210 and Melrose Place and all those kinds of things. Like at the time, it was just considered so normal for adults to play teenagers. And right. now we're like, mm, no. Although I will say some Disney Channel shows are still playing that game. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. But what I like about this visually is that you really get this feel for Spider-Man and what Spider-Man is capable of because without those stunts and without those graphics, you wouldn't really get the full aspect of what the character is capable of. We need to see Spider-Man swinging through New York. 
we need to see him doing these crazy flips and hanging on to the side of a building and yes. all of these things that you can draw so much more easily in a comic book than you can put onto the big screen. So the fact that they were able to accomplish those things, you know, it worked really well for them at the time. And while it might not age super well because we've been spoiled with better and better technology, yeah. I'm not yeah, going to hold that against movies. the movie. <laughs> right. And I think that one of the strongest points in it is that Raimi is, he is an old school practical de- practical dude when it comes to his special effects. Yeah. And I think his insistence on including at least some practical shots in everything that you see on screen helps because, and they were able to blend it so that for the most part, you can suspend most of the disbelief that, you know, the animated person and the backgrounds are all existing in the same world. They do a really good t- job, especially about the light for that time period. That's one of the most challenging things about something like that is putting, you know, the real world lighting and the animated lighting and making them seem like it's all coming from the same place. And they do a great job of that in this one. Yeah, they do. And even though it looked like video game tech at the time, I was like, well, that's a pretty good looking video game, if I'm being honest with you. And as someone who went from not playing video games since the PS2 was out to buying a Nintendo Switch this year, I was like, wow, this looks so great because I've, it been does. Playing, I've been playing Super Mario Odyssey and I was like, oh, so that's what Mario looks like when he's not a little 8-bit character. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And the, like the real, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes in, you know, Red Dead Redemption or something like that. Yeah, when, when the characters are more lifelike than Mario. <laughs> yes, Mario is real, man. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I've seen stills from the PlayStation 4 Spider-Man game and it just looks so fantastic. I was like, I would just watch someone play this game. I don't even need to play it Gorgeous. myself. I would just watch someone play it just so I could see everything going on in this and the world building that they've done. And I think that's something they did well here, the world building. They were like, okay, we're going to give you Uncle Ben. We're going to give you Aunt May. We're going to give you the Daily Bugle. We will give you all of these characters you know and either love or hate for various reasons. And we're going to build this out. And then it'll pay off more in the second movie. Right. And the biggest character of all in Spider-Man's world is for me, as in size wise, is New York City. Yes. And this is a very New York movie. Like it has that feel and sense that that time in New York pre 9-11, because let's all remember this was filmed and released right around that time period. So it is a very pre 9-11 when New York was considered a more safe place and they had the perfect amount of attitude in all of their like side characters and like the little, you know, the hot dog vendors and yeah. the bus drivers <laughs> and how it looks like it all feels very much New York. Yeah, definitely. Well, given everything we have discussed with the characters and the story and the visuals, what would you end up rating this now that you've rewatched it and sat with it maybe a little more? Well, this is a situation where my rating is not, uh, I'm rating this movie, but it is not in comparison to other Spider-Man films or other films in general. I would say this is probably a three, three and a half out of five. Because it does such a good job. Yeah, I have it right at a three out of five as well. Because I went back and I watched this. I was like, I remembered very little of this. I mean, obviously, I was familiar with Spider-Man's origin story already. Because how could I not be having been this many films in on Spider-Man? But like I said, when I was younger, this isn't something that I was sitting around rewatching over and over and over again. At least not that I recall, which means I probably didn't do that. So I was almost watching it again for the first time because of how little I remembered. It was like, okay, we know certain things are going to happen. And I don't really remember how they made any of those things happen. So to me, it was sort of refreshing that this wasn't as bad as I guess the internet made it seem like it was. Obviously, there are a lot of Spider-Man fans who love this movie and the second one. And then I I think almost everyone is in agreement on Spider-Man 3, from what I can tell, at least out of my 
friend yeah. and nerd group that I <laughs> discuss these things <laughs> with. So I was just pleasantly surprised when I rewatched this. I was like, you know what? This is a good movie. Is it great? No. Am I sitting there laughing like I am during, you know, maybe Spider-Man Far From Home or Homecoming? Not quite as much, honestly. And I think they definitely downplay Spider-Man's quippiness in this. And maybe that's because Tobey Maguire just wasn't the perfect person for that aspect of the character. And you know what? That's fine. To find a well-rounded Spider-Man is actually a pretty hard thing to do because he's someone who is constantly down on his luck but still manages to be extremely sarcastic and quippy when he is going up against bad guys. So it's kind of like two very different personalities with the character that you have to play. And it's a fine balance that you have to get. I agree. And it's, it's, if there's any criticism for Tobey Maguire's performance, which there's plenty of room for it, but <laughs> I think the biggest, not that I would, I would give it, but I can see how other people would. And I see your like, eh, this is where he's lacking. And I agree is that this, he is a little too much Peter Parker. And then Andrew Garfield is way too quippy, way too quippy and arrogant and then tom holland manages to capture both of these things and make it work but i think that we wouldn't have the spider-man that we get in far from home and you know the avengers and stuff without this movie because this was kind of the start and it feels very proto yeah if you know what i mean like it, it's much more comic booky it feels more like reading an old comic than watching, you know, Thor Ragnarok does. So it's kind of like, it's such an early example of the medium that it's still enjoyable for its own things. And I can look past all of the flaws that I find in it and just enjoy it. Even if, like you said, it's not great, but it's real good. It's one of those movies that didn't have the same opportunities as the current ones do one because of the technology but two because there hadn't been you know almost two decades worth of superhero movies to come before it and now these movies really just transcend the genre and that's not to say this one didn't because it made over 800 million dollars you know that's a lot of money it was sony's biggest movie until jumanji welcome to the jungle <laughs> it was their highest grossing earner, like the, which was 20 years later, if, more, if not more. Yeah. So they definitely had a hit on their hands with this one. There's no doubt about that. And I really feel like this was sort of the ground floor for what comes next with superhero movies. It's like, here's what we can do. And, you know, imagine what we can accomplish when the technology gets better. And we see that it improved even between... 2002 and 2004 when Spider-Man 2 came out. I think it was 2004 or 2005. Anyway, it was only two or three years later and the technology was vastly improved already. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at, because the X-Men, the first Brian Singer X-Men movie came out in 2000 and then this came out in 2002. Yeah. Th early 2002, wasn't it? Yeah. Man. And then... X-Men 2 in 2003, and then I think it was 2004 when the second one released. Like, this was the beginning of that. And each year you can see the technology grow and become better. And it it was very exciting to watch it because at the time you figure like, oh, well, this will be the one because this probably isn't going to make any money because people don't like superheroes. And then it finds a way to draw in people. And I think that's what this one did is it hasn't enough of a story and good enough special effects that even people who aren't like, Oh, Spider-Man, I cannot go and enjoy it and just be like, Oh, that was good. Yeah. I think with this one, it really just felt like you wanted to sit down, have a good time. And that's what they gave you. Yep. Yep. And they didn't, I don't think they were trying to go any further than that. I think that's the other thing is that this movie had a very definite aim. We want to recreate this specific type of comic book in a film format. And I think Sam Raimi achieves that very well because this does feel like an old Spider-Man comic and he makes it work despite the limitations. Plus he makes you feel everything that Peter Parker is feeling too. When he loses Uncle Ben, that is just such a heart-wrenching moment. 
And we right. all know it's coming <laughs> if we've read the right? comics. Punch to the gut. <laughs> and he still makes it feel that way, which is really impressive. So, you know, overall, like I said, good movie, not perfect. I don't think I've rated any of the Spider-Man movies a five out of five. So, you know, given that the ones I have left to rewatch are Spider-Man 3 and the two amazing Spider-Man movies, probably not going to happen. You know, no. I don't think I'm going out on a limb saying that. <laughs> no. Spider-Man 3, I maintain, is better than people say it is, but... Those amazing Spider-Man movies are painful at times. <laughs> yeah, I picked those up because they were one of the deals on Amazon Prime Day. So I was like, all right, you know what? Oh, I nice. I like Spider-Man enough to where if I spend, I don't, it might have been like 15 bucks for the two movies on Blu-ray and digital. So I was like, all right, you know, I'm getting more than one format. And, you know, it came with this little like limited edition book kind of thing that has pictures from the movie and stuff. But anyway, that discussion will be for two different podcasts because I'm sure I will be yep. covering those at some point as well. Once I find someone who wants to pity me and talk about Spider-Man 3, I might already have someone yeah. lined up. I'm not 100% sure, but <laughs> I'll have to check on that. But Katie, thank you so much for coming on to discuss Spider-Man with me. And, you know, I think it's safe to say we both just really love these comic book movies. <laughs> we do. We really, really do. And thank you for having me. It's always fun. Of course. Before we go, I want to let you all know about our Patreon. Right now, there are two tiers that are more specific to Welcome to Geekdom. The first tier is a dollar a month. That is just showing your general support. I'll give you a, a shout out on the podcast to thank you. The other one is five dollars a month and that lets you pick a topic of welcome to geekdom and it'll ensure that i actually cover it because you know i've had some suggestions and it's like watch 11 seasons of the show and i was like i will do that when i can <laughs> yeah so if you want to support the podcast all it takes is a dollar a month and i would greatly appreciate it you can find us at geekdom pod on twitter and at welcome to geekdom on instagram and facebook and as always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.